So, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is my second favorite book of the series, and that's a very close second. My love for it is immense and every time I reread these books, which is often, it just hardens my opinion. Unfortunately, it is also without a doubt my least favorite movie of the bunch. I know the discussion of book to movie adaptations, especially with books as popular as Harry Potter, is tiresome and overdone. What more is there to say that hasn't already been stated a million times? That is a major reason why, despite wanting to do this for a long time, I held off from making videos that focused on each of these books and movies individually. But I've decided to do it now firstly because rereading the series and watching the movies is helping me calm down and get distracted from everything going on right now. And secondly because my approach to this isn't going to be books good, movies bad. I know that I'm not a book purist. I've loved the movie since I was five and if you look at what the fans of Percy Jackson, Aragon, Divergent and many more were cursed with, my appreciation for what they accomplished with the movies has only gotten deeper. These are two completely different mediums and people can be far too unreasonable in what they're demanding be fit into a less than three hour runtime. Also, my grievances with the Goblet of Fire movie, I think is different from what the most prominent arguments against it are. I've watched a couple video essays from people that didn't like the movie and they differ from what I'm about to say. Some of the most common complaints with the movie are the exclusion of the Quidditch World Cup, which, while I agree that it's a little disappointing and the pacing is weird because there's all this build up for it, then they just skip over it entirely, not showing even a second of the match. There are still plenty of other action sequences in the book and the Quidditch match is one of the few that you can actually cut out for time so it needed to be done. Same applies to Hermione's SPEW subplot. I would have loved for it to be included in some way because it added so much to her character. This is when she puts on her activist badge and fights against something that she knows is unjust but fails at it because her approach was severely flawed and she sort of ends up doing more harm than good. It both showed her heart as well as flaws and blind spots that she has. A dimension to her that was definitely needed in movie Hermione as I talked about in my adaptational attractiveness this video. However, including this in the movie and developing it the way it was done in the book is impossible. There's just no time for it and it isn't relevant to the overall Potter story. They also cut out some really prominent characters entirely. While some of this definitely sucks, I don't really care and I can't complain because I really do believe that it can be excused as a necessary evil in order to get the end product, which is a two and a half hour cohesive movie. With all that being said, there are examples of omissions and changes in the entire series that I refuse used to excuse as just being an issue of runtime. And what is most disappointing about it in Goblet of Fire, more so than the others, is that it's not massive scenes and subplots that I really wanted. It is character moments. Character moments that were distorted or thrown away to make room for something else. Which brings me to the topic of this video. Character versus action. Something has always felt a little off about the Goblet of Fire movie to me. I don't hate it at all. And I know that many people, especially people that haven't read the book, love it. But what I've realized is, for me at least, it's an issue of character. The reason I'm constantly revisiting Harry Potter is not for plot. I know every single beat in the story like the back of my hand. What makes rereads so satisfying is that there are literally hundreds of character moments that never fail to make me feel like I did the first time I read it. That is because character has always been the priority in the stories and it is the highlight. Yet in the Goblet of Fire movie I get the sense that this one really prioritizes action over character. First let's look at action through the lens of over dramatization. Did you put your name into the Goblet of Fire Harry? He asked calmly. Harry! Harry! Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? Oh, I know this one clip has been memed and discussed a million times over to the point where I honestly almost didn't include it in this video. No, it is not that big of a deal that it ruins the entire movie, but it does perfectly show what the director's approach to this movie was, one that I disagree with. A lot of people tend to blame Michael Gambon for this scene, and I think that's wrong because there's no way he would have done that unless it was the direction he was given. Sure, the original Dumbledore, Richard Harris, was perfect at portraying Dumbledore's calm nature. I'll still always defend Michael Gambon who can both show the soft Dumbledore as well as the intimidating one that is necessary as we get into the second half of the series. This isn't a Michael Gambon issue, it's the director. He chose over dramatization at the expense of how a character would really behave, just so a scene can appear more intense. Take Hermione for instance. You can tell Ronald. I'm not an owl! In the books when Harry and Ron are fighting and Harry's at his lowest point with most of the school including his best friend not believing him, Hermione's there for him and acts as a mediator between the two. Does he still think I entered myself? Well, no, I don't think so. Not really. 
said Hermione awkwardly. What's that supposed to mean, not really? Oh, Harry, isn't it obvious? Hermione said despairingly. He's jealous. Jealous? Jealous of what? He wants to make a prat of himself in front of the whole school, does he? Look, said Hermione patiently. It's always you who gets all the attention. You know it is. I know it's not your fault. I know you don't ask for it. But, well, you know, Ron's got all those brothers to compete against at home. And you're his best friend and you're really famous. He's always shunted to one side whenever people see you. And he puts up with it and he never mentions it. But I suppose this is just one time too many. In the movie, it's like she sides with Ron and is fine with him sending her to deliver a message to Harry. But when Harry simply wants to reply, she snaps at him, as if he isn't going through enough, which is so out of character for her. A very underrated aspect of Book Hermione is her emotional intelligence. That is thrown out the window in the Goblet of Fire movie in place of a Hermione that is so hot-tempered for some reason. With the Yule Ball, one of the many things I love about the chapter is that Hermione, despite being treated horribly by Ron and him ruining her night, she still manages to keep it together. When she asks him why he's so upset and he gives the ridiculous excuse that the only reason Crumb asked her to be his date is to get info on Harry, she articulates why it's completely ridiculous. Then at the end of the chapter, she gets the mic drop moment against Ron saying, next time there's a ball, ask me before someone else does, and not as a last resort. Ron mouths soundlessly like a goldfish out of water, as Hermione turned on her heel and stormed up the girl's staircase to bed. Well, he spluttered, looking thunderstruck. Well, that just proves completely miss the point. Harry didn't say anything. He liked being back on speaking terms with Ron too much to speak his mind right now, but he somehow thought that Hermione had gotten the point much better than Ron had. Anyone reading this can see Hermione is the emotionally mature one, stating the obvious and putting Ron in his place. In the movie, the dynamic is so weird because even though they do make it clear that Ron is jealous, and even though she says the same line almost verbatim, Next time there's a ball, pluck up the courage and ask me before somebody else does. And not as a last resort. She is so unhinged in this scene. Where have you been? Never mind, off to bed, both of you. And Ron is the one that gets the last laugh by saying, They get scary when they get older. Ron, you spoiled everything! The only reason I could think of for why they made it this way is so that it appears more dramatic. And that's the problem. I think there's a misunderstanding here that in order for the audience to be entertained, it all needs to be over the top, instead of trusting the audience to be able to pick up on smaller emotional cues. Now we get to, of course, literally prioritizing action over character. And this is most apparent in the third act. The climax in both the book and the movie is really well done. I don't care as much as the others about the exclusion of magical creatures in the maze. I do have small complaints like, I wish the build up to Harry's parents was done as it was in the books where the dead came back one by one rather than them appearing instantly. I wish his mother had the line, your father is coming, she said quietly. He wants to see you, it will be all right. Hold on. Just her saying, he wants to see you, rips my heart out every time, but I'll let it slide. There's also the moment when Harry and Cedric are at the end of the maze. In the book, Harry and Cedric had just fought off a giant spider and the cop was right there. The moment is quiet and for two pages, they engage in a really heartwarming back and forth over who should win. Take it then, Harry panted to Cedric. Go on, take it, you're there. But Cedric didn't move. He merely stood there, looking at Harry. Then he turned to stare at the cop. Harry saw the longing expression on his his face in its golden light. Cedric looked around at Harry again. Cedric took a deep breath. You take it. You should win. That's twice you've saved my neck there. The brilliance of this part in the book, especially on rereads, is knowing that this is Cedric's last moment alive and he's spending it by being such a virtuous person and giving off something he desperately wants. And Harry, in his complete innocence, suggests they take it together, not knowing that by doing the admirable thing here, he would inadvertently bring Cedric to his death. In the movie, this isn't a quiet, lingering moment between these two. It's a quick six seconds where the maze, for some reason, is forcing them in the direction of the cop and they have to make a decision quickly. You saved me, take it. Together. One, two, three. And this gets into what I was talking about with overdramatization. The action of the third task should be over at this point. You can give these characters a quiet moment and a little time to show what they're thinking. It doesn't have to be many minutes long, but at least longer than six seconds. But at least what followed after this in the graveyard was adapted really well. Thank God they didn't cut out the darkest, most heartbreaking final words someone can hear in Kill the Spare 
what is truly egregious and inexcusable in the movie. And what helps the most in knocking it down to the bottom of my list is that in a good third act, there is space between the end of the climax and the end of the movie where the audience should be reflecting on what's just happened and the story as a whole. Rowling has said that this book is almost the heart of the series. And I think that is most apparent during this section of the book. It is done so well. It is both beautiful and gut-wrenching, particularly with two scenes that just needed to be included in the movie but weren't. After the Madai Moody Body Crouch Jr. reveal, it is not supposed to just cut straight to the final day of school. The rest of the night is vital in showing Harry's emotional state. First, he goes up with Dumbledore to his office where Sirius is waiting for him. The omission of Sirius in this movie, aside from letters and the common room scene, is crazy to me. I know Sirius doesn't change the plot of this book in any way, but his presence is so important and they obviously felt it was important enough to include him through letters and that one meeting. So why not when Harry has just gone through the most traumatic thing he's experienced so far? It's not an issue of runtime because they could easily cut out the letter and fireplace scenes, neither of which were interesting or moving, and instead replace it with the scene of the trio going to the cave in Hogsmeade where Sirius is hiding out in the books. That way he can actually appear in the end when Harry needs him. In Dumbledore's office, Harry is numb and his body is shaking. Dumbledore asks him to recount what happened after he touched the cup. Sirius says he should leave it to the morning and let Harry sleep. Then Dumbledore delivers one of my favorite passages in the series, saying, If I thought I could help you, Dumbledore said gently, by putting you into an enhanced sleep and allowing you to postpone the moment when you would have to think about what has happened tonight, I would do it. But I know better. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. I ask you to tell me what happened. Heart-wrenching but beautiful. You see how deep Harry is affected by the nightmare he just experienced. You see how much Sirius cares for him and his well-being. You see Dumbledore's wise, calming, and powerful presence. I refuse to accept that this had to be cut for time. It is completely necessary. Take out that boring scene with Dumbledore talking about burning his curtains and use that time for this scene in his office with Sirius. In the movie, Harry honestly looks fine after everything that's happened. You really need to show the effect the climax of the story has had on him that night. Aside from this scene, there's another I want to talk about. In the movie, Harry's emotion regarding Cedric's death is all limited to one scene. It plays out differently in the book where Harry is in a quiet state of shock clinging onto Cedric's body rather than yelling. Harry let go of him, he heard Fudge's voice say, and he felt fingers trying to prise him from Cedric's limp body, but Harry wouldn't let him go. Then Dumbledore's face, which was still blurred and misted, came closer. Harry, you can't help him now. It's over. Let go. He wanted me to bring him back, Harry muttered. It seemed important to explain this. He wanted me to bring him back to his parents. Even though I wouldn't change how it is in the book, I also welcome this one instance of overdramatization because this is much harder to translate onto screen. I think they made the right decision by hearing the cheers of everyone celebrating their win, <laughs> then Fleur scream, <laughs> then Harry crying, then Amos breaking down. It was really powerful. The problem is, they leave it at that. You can't just have the climax, then cut to a different day with the quick, somber scene in the Great Hall, then the last day of school with Harry smiling with his friends. This is a real pivotal moment in the series. His childhood innocence is officially over at this point, and you need to hit it home. Aside from Dumbledore's office scene, there's also a Molly Weasley scene that would have done it. There are three really great Weasley parent scenes in the book that I love to death, none of which are included in the movie. First is towards the start of the book when they pick Harry up from the Dursleys. It's a very fun and comedic chapter with them wreaking havoc over the Dursley house. But the best moment is... Well, bye then, Harry said to the Dursleys. They didn't say anything at all. Harry moved towards the fire, but just as he reached the edge of the hearth, Mr. Weasley put out a hand and held him back. He was looking at the Dursleys in amazement. Harry said goodbye to you, he said. Didn't you hear him? It doesn't matter. Harry muttered to Mr. Weasley. Honestly, I don't care. Mr. Weasley did not remove his hand from Harry's shoulder. You aren't going to see your nephew till next summer, he said to Uncle Vernon in mild indignation. 
Surely you're going to say goodbye. Vernon is then forced to say goodbye. It's so nice for Harry to have people stick up for him in a home that has brought him nothing but misery. And this entire book is where the Weasleys are no longer just like family. They truly become that for him. The second is when, before the third task, all the competitors are told that family has come to visit and watch. McGonagall tells Harry that his family has come as well and he's mortified thinking that it's the Dursleys. Only to find that it's Molly and Bill which makes him so happy that it comes his nerves about the task. Maybe you can say these needed to be cut for time, especially the first one as the movie begins at the burrow and is so fast paced from then on. But at the very least include the third one which happens at the end when Harry breaks down into the arms of Mrs. Weasley on the night of Voldemort's return. The thing against which he had been fighting on and off ever since he had come out of the maze was threatening to overpower him. He could feel a burning, prickling feeling in the inner corner of his eyes. He blinked and stared up at the ceiling. It wasn't your fault Harry, Mrs. Weasley whispered. I told him to take the cup with me, said Harry. Now the burning feeling was in his throat too. He wished Ron would look away. Mrs. Weasley set the potion down on the bedside cabinet, bent down and put her arms around Harry. He had no memory of ever being hugged like this as though by a mother. The full weight of everything he had seen that night seemed to fall in upon him as Mrs. Weasley held him to her. His mother's face, his father's voice, the sight of Cedric dead on the ground, all started spinning in his head until he could hardly bear it, until he was screwing up his face against the howl of misery fighting to get out of him. I don't understand how you can cut that out. These character moments in the third act are needed. The Goblet of Fire movie knows how to adapt action. The tasks are great, visually they hold up and are some of the best in the series. Same with the graveyard scene. But Harry Potter to me is character first. And that is where this movie fails. Imagine if as much attention and as much priority were placed on these character chapters as were placed on the action-packed chapters on the Triwizard Tournament. The movie would be balanced, it would be incredible. But that's not what they did and that is why it is at the bottom of my list. Character first, always. Thank you for watching. Bye.